So some time ago, I actually reviewed the Supermicro E200 Super Server, which is about that big. And the use case back then was, how do we build a vSAN cluster for less than $6,000? So what exactly the use case back then? Oh, you know, with remote office, branch office solutions, really tiny deployments and so on and so forth. So today, what could potentially be better than the $6,000 super server? As always, if the content makes sense and you enjoy the stuff that I'm doing, please hit subscribe and also leave a comment if you have any. So coming back to today's discussion, what could potentially be better than the E200 in a small form factor? Last year when I was at VMworld, I walked past Supermicro's booth and I was introduced to this net new uh, box that they were trying to push out. It looked a lot like the E200 with a little bit of an extra. So the gentleman spoke to me and said, hey, you know what, we're going to come up with a lot more innovations with regards to this super server. And one of them are actually the fanless design. I haven't seen it. Um, I, I've heard some good reviews about the fanless design. But the other one was particularly intriguing, a little chunkier version of the E200. So I just pinged the good folks at Supermicro to check out if they were keen enough or kind enough to actually send a couple of these boxes out for me to play with. Thankfully, they were actually very nice. They actually sent me this whole bunch of Super Micro boxes and not only one, three of them. So today, I'm actually gonna go through and tear down the boxes and have a quick look at them, walk you guys through what is new. Also, run a new install of vSAN on it. I'm quite sure you guys have been at VMworld recently. There's a lot of new exciting stuff with vSAN 7 uh, update one. So I'm gonna run some performance benchmark on the box and see what we're gonna get out of it. All right, let's uh, get this rolling. So this is actually how the Super Micro box look like. Uh, probably not going to fit on the frame of the camera, but you get the idea. Let's open this up. So inside the box, you'll find two smaller boxes. Uh, I'll open them up in a while. And of course, the unit in itself. Okay, let's have a look at the boxes. So opening up the this aside, this box. Uh, what have we got? Um, as you can see, this looks like the little pull-out label uh, where you put your IP address and host names. All right, that's a nice touch. Um, some rubber feet. I believe those are screws for the uh, hard drives and a couple of cable ties. Okay, this looks like the PCIe mount. So if you do use the PCIe, you can swap this out and then you have access to the back panel and spare SATA cable. All right, cool. Let's close this box up, put this back in. Let's have a look at the next box. I'm assuming this is the power brick, feels like it at least. Okay, here is a power brick. Um, as you can see, it's probably a lot larger than what you're familiar with with the E200. Otherwise, it looks nice and chunky. Um, I probably need to swap this out for Singapore Power Leads, but that's okay. Alright, let's put this away. Okay, let's have a quick look at the box. Uh, at the front end, pretty unassuming, very, very similar to the E200. The big difference here, if you can see, is actually this little half U addition. And that's where it's interesting, this one. Uh, when I pop it open, you will see how different it is. So uh, power buttons and reset, nothing peculiar. Side, some mount points for real mount kits. Exhaust, very similar. To the back, as you can see, um, there is that uh, additional half U height. But otherwise, um, same, US, uh, DC power, two USB ports, IPMI. Um, this one comes with four 1G ports, which is very nice, uh, two 10Gs, and also two SFP+. Plus. So if you run SFPs, that would be fantastic. And you have VGA. This side, um, nothing much. Uh, that riser card uh, mount point comes here. Looks like you probably need to kind of bend this off and pop it open. But otherwise, I'm probably not going to use it. Coming on this side, similar. You have vents, mount points. And that's it. So on the top, a little bit different from the E200, as you can see, it's got this little grill light thing. Um, probably for cooling, I don't know, or maybe just design aesthetics, nothing special. 
Let's look at the bottom. Um, some labels. Uh, you could actually mount this on the wall, it seems. So you have um, mount points here. You can actually hook it on the wall. All right. So now let's pop it open. Um, as you can see, uh, I've taken out the screws for easy access. All you need to do is just kind of push it to the back and it pops, pull it open, and then voila. I've actually hooked up the drives um, for ease of um, display just to give you a feel of how it looks like. As you can see, the big difference here is the fact that it actually comes with two drive caddies. These two drive caddies are nice because you can actually put up to four drives in it. So it's quite a bit of capacity that you can actually sit on it. So what I do like here, I'm not too sure if you can get the focus, is the fact that they have screws here, but you could actually do without the screws as well. Obviously, we have screws to make it a little bit more secure, but it's got little, little tabs here that, let me see if I can get in focus, that pops it into place. So it's a pretty nice addition. Um, so for test purposes, I kind of like the fact that I can just pop drives in and pop drives out. Very nice. So, um, yeah. Uh, it's got this little riser bolt here, so, uh, understandably to kind of raise it. But this is really, really the key differentiator for this particular unit. Um, I, I reckon this would be great B sand boxes uh, in the field um, because with the E200 historically, you could only really put one or two drives at most, and that's a very, very cramped um, setup. But this gives you enough capacity to run B sand with a couple of this group. Very nice. Hey. Okay. So let's look at taking this out. So uh, I like how they've done this as well. If you look at this riser screw here, uh, it actually doubles up as a screw to hold this mounting plate in place. So let's pop that open. So these are the screws. I'm not sure you can get it in focus. There it is. I'll put this aside. So this is how it looks like inside. Um, just to make it easier, I'll probably pop these cables out. So closer look, uh, those are the drives there again, just in case. Alright, All right, the unit in itself, um, as you can see, let's move these cables aside. You have the chipset. So the big difference between this and the E200, you get an 8 core 16 threads here. Um, of course, this is a built-in chipset. With the E200, you get a 6 core 12 threads. So with this, nice upgrade, 8 and 16. So what else do you have here? Um, similarly, we have 4 dim slots. So nothing's changed a lot there. 1, 2, 3, 4. But however, with unlike the E200, you get a max of 128 gig on an ECC R dim on the E200. With this, you actually get a whopping 512 gig. Um, you know, it's a very nice chunky box. I mean, given the size of this thing, 512, fantastic. So moving along, uh, what do we have here? Ah, okay. So you have a couple of PCIe slots here. You can see we have a PCIe 16 and a PCIe 8. So a couple of options there, very, very nice addition. You have an M2 NVMe key here. Uh, I believe there's another slot somewhere here um, for a different form factor. So here it is, I think the, the B key. Okay, if you, have, if you end up upgrade, uh, needing a B key, there it is. Couple of uh, SATA ports here. You have four ports here. So compared with the E200, you have about, if I'm not mistaken, about six or definitely more than four. So that's a nice uh, quick difference here. Uh, don't fret if you need more because there is more ports here for SATA as well. These ports can also be converted into U2 for NVMe if you wanted to. But uh, as it is, they have given cables. Okay, so these cables um, are for the SATA ports and of course the power leads that come with it. Okay, uh, from a fan situation perspective, it seems like you could probably fit another fan here, um, but the data sheet shows that you can have up to three fans, and I don't think you could. It looks a little bit tiny and seems to have a warning sign here. But anyhow, three fans, personally, good enough. One thing I did notice though about this particular box, it's a lot, lot quieter than the E200 was. So 
Um, I'm not too sure what they've done. I mean, on boot with E200, the fans just go crazy. For this, uh, didn't go nuts. I mean, it just went whirling and idling for a bit, and that was it. So I kind of like the fact that this box is a lot more well refined. Well, form factor wise, still very very good. Okay. So sorry for the cable mess. I'll clean it up in a short while, but here you go. Now that you have seen inside the box, let's look at what the box can actually do. Generally, with most customers, they have a perception that a box this small, this yay high box, will not be able to outperform a full-blown server. Not too long ago, I actually did a benchmark on you know, the gold standard for vSAN performance, which is the VxRail P series. I will leave the links below as well uh, to that particular benchmark test. But we are talking about 160,000 on a 7030 read write profile, 160k IOPS that is. And um, I, I didn't actually note it in that particular article, but it came to about almost 380,000 IOPS from 100% write performance. So that's pretty impressive for a four node VX rail with two disk group um, and each of this disk group having five drives. But let's come back to this particular uh, super micro box. I actually have only one disk group and one uh, cache drive and two capacity drive. So I have significantly less drives. And bear in mind, I've only got three nodes. So what performance did I get out of these three nodes? Um, I've actually pasted the performance numbers here. If you look at it, this is a 100% read profile and it's performing extraordinarily good. I mean, we're talking about 300K IOPS on a 4K read. That's phenomenal for three small servers with barely any drives in it. Um, I actually ran a 7030 profile as well, but unfortunately I haven't got a screenshot for that. But we're looking at about 80, 90,000 IOPS and that's pretty commendable as well. I mean, when you compare that with the likes of the VX Rail, which is full-blown enterprise systems. Hopefully, I busted the myth around performance and tiny boxes. It may not, you know, scale as the way you want a large server to be with as many slots for drives, etc. But definitely, it's more than sufficient for many, many use cases. Coming to use cases, what kind of use cases specifically does this box open up to? These boxes, because of its small form factor, can fit into various environments. So similarly, like the E200 before it, it can fit into, you know, say a remote office, branch office. It can be used for software-defined network virtualization. Um, obviously, today there's a lot of talk about a, you know, 5G infrastructure and whatnot. And with that, there's a lot of edge devices, IoT devices, uh, NFV edge appliances. So all this requires some level of compute at the edge. And because of this box capacity and capability, this is well suited for all those kind of use cases. With that, hopefully I've given you a little bit of insight of what the E30190 is capable of. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, it also comes in an AMD flavor. So if Intel's not your kind of thing and AMD Epic is your cup of tea, you know, feel free to check out the AMD version. And with that, thank you so much again and I'll see you guys next time.